Hello, YouTube listeners. You are all very special because you have the ability to like episodes right here and now. So please hit that thumbs up before you close the tab and get to your creative work. It helps out so much for the YouTube algorithm, especially as I'm starting out. So thank you very much for doing that up front. And don't forget that you can always subscribe on your favorite podcast app to listen on your phone when you're on the go. Thanks for listening to this episode, and I'll see you face-to-face on Wednesday right here on YouTube for my shorter, bite-sized dose of inspiration. Enjoy the show and create something amazing. Your Creative Push, episode 351. You're going to be your worst critic, and you're going to hold yourself back more than anybody else is. Welcome to Your Creative Push, the podcast that pushes you to pursue your creative passions. I'm your host, Youngman Brown, and my guest today is Ashley Izanicki. Ashley, aka Miss You Pacey, is a Colorado-born artist who works in both digital and traditional mediums. She graduated from Laguna College of Art and Design and now resides in California, and her work often features dark and macabre themes with a cute and feminine touch. And Ashley comes on the show today to talk about her biggest lessons and takeaways from teaching her course, Artists as Entrepreneurs, and her advice for getting over the fear of posting your art online. She also shares the inspiration that she got from Neil Gaiman's advice to imagine your goals as a mountain, making a five-year plan, and going absolutely crazy with it, and her advice for pricing original pieces, especially for artists who are just starting to sell their work. Ashley also discusses her resistances and how she gets past them, such as imposter syndrome, comparison, fear of the blank page, time management, and being your own worst critic. And finally, Ashley shares what it's like to learn how to tattoo from Sarah Fable and what it was like to run a Kickstarter campaign for her book, Nightshade. I had a great time talking with Ashley, and this is an episode that's going to inspire you no matter where you are in your art career and no matter what you do as a creative passion. So without further ado, please give it up for my guest today, Ashley Eisenicki. Ashley, welcome to Your Creative Push. Thank you for having me. No, thank you so much for being on. Um, I always like at the start of the show to give my guests the opportunity to sort of introduce yourself and tell us how you got to the point you are today, creatively speaking. Gosh, okay, so where to begin? <laughs> I grew up in a really, really small town in Colorado called Grand Junction. Um, Most people drive through it or go to our one McDonald's. So (laughs) that's really cool. I don't have really a creative family. Nobody's into art or anything like that. Uh, But I was really obsessed with dinosaurs as a kid. And so I would draw dinosaurs all the time in like the bloodiest battles (laughs) and like gruesome and bloody Um, and as I grew up, I wanted to be a paleontologist for the longest time. Um, but I kind of, oh, that's awesome. (laughs) Dinosaur nerds unite. (laughs) Jurassic Park for life. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I watched that way too many times. And Land Before Time. Oh my God. I can't talk about Land Before Time with my parents. They'll kill me. (laughs) Oh no. That's a, that's another podcast entirely. I'm sorry for interrupting. (laughs) No worries. No worries. Um, and so I, I wanted to be in paleontology for a long time, but then I kind of realized that I just enjoyed drawing a lot. And I drew it like throughout school. And then in high school, I kind of finally realized that I wanted to do that as a career because I ended up liking to draw more things than just dinosaurs. Yeah. So after that, I, um, wanted to be an animator. So in high school, I was like, Oh, cool. You know, I'll work for Disney. That'll be fun. And I wanted to go to art school because I'm like, if I'm going to go into an art career, I want to just jump in and go to a really nice art school and get the best education that I could get. Unfortunately, it's expensive. So I had to take like a year in community college to get all my gen eds out of Mm -hmm. the way. So it'd be cheaper to go to art school. And then I went to Laguna College of Art and Design And I applied for animation and they said, you probably wouldn't do well in animation. Let's move you to illustration. So I was bummed about that, but they were right. I love illustration way more. I would never want to be an animator. (laughs) It was a dumb choice to begin with um, because I cannot, I cannot draw things over and over and over again. Mm. Um, So I went to illustration, 
graduated from there. And in between there, I like started posting on Instagram and that kind of took off without me realizing it or noticing it. I was just like, cool, I want to actually post my art online so people can see it. So by the time I graduated, I had a good enough following to where I would get jobs from that and where I could make money off of selling my own work and going to conventions. And now I'm here. And now you're here. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, yeah, One of my questions that I was going to ask you is like the the notion of starting to post on Instagram. And I think it's, it's something that a lot of people um, are afraid to do, especially when they're first starting out because they're, um, they're afraid that they haven't reached the level of the people that they have a taste for, you know, the people Mm -hmm. that they follow that have a large body of work that have been doing it for a long time. And they feel like they're afraid to post their work that isn't at the level that they want to be at yet. Um, so maybe could you take us back to that mindset or maybe it wasn't even a mindset? Like h- how did you encourage yourself to to just start posting your art? Oh, well, it's, it's interesting that you asked that because I used to actually, um, after I graduated a few years after Elk had invited me back to teach a class on uh, artists in social media and everything. And that's like the biggest question people ask is like, mm. how do you get over that fear? And it's really just doing it like there's no way to overcome it other than posting putting it out there and just like walking away it's scary and I used to hate it um and it used to terrify me to know that somebody would look at my art or not like it or say something bad about it and everything um but you realize that the art community isn't as scary as you thought it was and (laughs) people actually don't go out and like comment, Oh, you missed this knuckle on this finger and it's terrible. Um, there are people that do that, but you rarely get them in the very beginning. Um, so just kind of taking that leap is the only way for you to get over it. Definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What we picture the, the outside world to be is always, um, much, much harsher. <laughs> it's like <laughs> kind of like those bloody dinosaurs you were talking about. We imagine that everything, everyone's out to get us, just like ready to attack. But it really is a bunch of sweethearts out there, especially because people that are most likely going to find you are people that are trying to do it themselves or have a have an appreciation for the process itself. So it's really not that bad. It's kind of like you got to rip the bandaid off. <laughs> oh yeah, no. Everybody's. I've met so many wonderful people and so many people who have reached out to me that kind of reached out at the right time. And when I'm like, I'm going to quit art. I hate this. I hate everything I'm doing. And they're like, no, I love your work. It inspired me so much. And they've pushed me to keep going. So it's not that scary out there. Um, And there are some really amazing people. And it's nice to form that community by just posting on social media. Right. And now I didn't know that you taught that class. So that that was a class all about what we're just talking about, like growing a following on social media or making connections or what? Yeah. So it was uh, called artist, artist as entrepreneurs. God, that's such a tough, that's a, that is tough to say. Entrepreneur, <laughs> yeah. entrepreneur is hard enough, but then <laughs> <laughs> add artist in the front of it and just make it yeah. terrible. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I taught that with uh, my best friend, who's also another illustrator on uh, Instagram, who's big on Instagram. Um, life illustration. And we taught that class together to help young kids who are still in school figure out how to get big on social media, how to go to conventions, how to sell stuff online, how to get freelance work, kind of how to be an artist in today's industry rather than how it was five years, 10 years ago. Yeah, because it is a new thing that nobody, I think, has quite developed like a formula for (laughs) it's kind of (laughs) trial and error so what what are some of the maybe tips that you could share from that class as as far as growing a following and also uh, making those connections in order to turn your art into a business yeah so the biggest thing is that you're going to be your worst critic and you're going to hold yourself back more than anybody else is Um, so it's really like the biggest thing that I talk about is 
making a five-year plan and going absolutely crazy on it. Like put your wildest dreams in that five-year plan. If you want to, you know, be a teacher, if you want to go to Comic-Con, if you want to do like a comic book for DC, like put it down in that five-year plan, put it on paper so you can see it day in and day out. And you take those steps to get there. Even if it's, you're just doing it like subconsciously, you know, you saying, okay, I want to be here in five years. Then you're like, okay, so this could get me there and this could get me there. And I'll take this job because this might lead to this and so on and so forth. Like, I think um, when I wrote my five-year plan, I actually said that like in five years, I want to be invited back to LCAD to teach. And in two years, that actually happened. And I was like, whoa, nice. like that's insane. And I also wrote down that I wanted to go to like certain comic conventions. And then I started getting invited to go to comic conventions where they paid for the table. And that was just like, insane to me because a year before that I was like okay this will never happen but I wrote it down and I saw it every day and I was like okay so if I go to this convention or if I talk to this person then maybe that'll network me into the position I want to be right and the thing I like about the five-year plan is it it's a good buffer I think that's a good amount of time because it's not too far out in the future where you're like uh envisioning yourself as an old woman or an old man <laughs> like, yeah. t- telling your grandkids about it, you know, like, you know, like a 40 year goal, but mm-hmm. five years, that's like, okay, like I can see myself walking that path, but it's also like a whole lot of time. Like there's a lot you can do in five years. Like this podcast isn't even five years old and I can't like <laughs> all of the stuff that's happened podcast wise and my life wise. And, you know, I haven't even mar- been married for five years. Like so much can happen in five years. When you look back, it's like, wow, like there's a ton of time as long as you're able to have that goalpost, you know, mm-hmm. that you're, you, you continually move towards every day. Yeah, there's uh, a Neil Gaiman. I think he did a speech at a, uh, a graduation. And Ooh, I love that he one. said, yeah, <laughs> everybody's seen it. And I like think of it religiously all the time of how, you know, you have to imagine your goals as a mountain. And you're just going towards that mountain continuously. And, you know, if there's a path that takes you away from the mountain, then you can say no, as long as you're looking straight towards that mountain. Right. Super important. Mm -hmm. Now, um, in terms of making money and commissions and stuff like that, what advice would you have for people that haven't even maybe even considered selling their art? Like maybe they've reached a point where they're proud enough of their work and they have enough of their work maybe lying <laughs> around that they're like, all right, like I need, either need to like throw this out or like frame it or or sell it, like <laughs> make it have a home. Would you have any advice for that process? Not just like getting in that mindset, but also like practical things like pricing and stuff like that. Yeah. So commissions are hard and selling your art's hard, especially in the beginning, because you're, you have no clue like what you want to set the price tag to, or if anybody will actually pay it. But when it comes to pricing, I always think of it as, okay, so if you have this piece, how long did you work on it? How much tools and materials did you use to make this? You also have to pay attention to how long you've studied art, how, (laughs) like how much time practicing it took you to get to where you are to do this drawing. And you have to factor all those in to get a price that makes sense to you. And for some people, they factor all that in and they're like, wow, that's like 300 to $500 in my head. I don't think anybody will pay that. Like that's, that's insane. But when it comes to art, especially originals, I know it's like, it only takes one person to pay that price to sell that original. You don't have to sell to a whole bunch of people. You just have to find that one person who looks at that and the price tag and says, yes, that's completely worth it. When I made this huge illustration that I worked on for a really long time and I finally set the price to like $1,000 and that was the most I've ever priced an original at. And I was like talking to my friend, I was like, I, I can't do this. Nobody's going to buy it for this price. Like, I'm totally freaking out. I don't want to, maybe I should lower it. And she was like, no, just post it as $1,000 and see what happens. And like in the first 20 seconds, I got somebody to buy it. 
And <laughs> I was just seconds. like, yeah, yeah, I posted it. And then I got a DM and I was like, oh my God, like I could have cheapened it out <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I could have made less. And I think that's hard for people when they're starting out to sell stuff. It's like, I don't think anybody's going to buy that price, but you're the one who sets it. And if you lower the price, you're lowering the value. Nobody else is. It's just mm-hmm. you in your that mindset. So if you see something and you're like, okay, so I factored in everything and I would be happy with $500, you keep it there. Don't lower it because people don't seem interested or it's taking a little while. It's $500. That's how much your art is worth. You set that price. Right. And you also can't quantify like a potential buyer's life. Like you can't uh, quantify their experiences. A certain piece might resonate so much with a person or a couple or whatever it may be. Like it fits into the narrative of their life perfectly. And like no amount of money really matters when they need to have that. You know what I mean? (laughs) So it's like kind of like not like discounting that before you even, you know, put it up. Yeah. And I mean, it's, there's some points where like that original sold really fast, but then some of my originals took a long time, but somebody like still bought it. There's always going to be just that one person who wants it and needs it and connects with it. And that's who you're selling to. You're not selling to like a whole bunch of people. Can a whole bunch of people afford this? That doesn't matter. What matters is you find that single person who loves it. Right. And now in terms of like commissions and doing Mm -hmm. something for somebody else, how much of it is your choice of what you're making and how much goes to the person who is uh, buying it? Yeah. So (laughs) I used to do a lot of commissions that didn't have a lot of creative freedom on me. And I really started to hate doing commissions Mm. because people would be like, I want this and I want to change this. And this has to look perfectly like this, which when artistic freedom is taken away from me, my art slowly goes down. (laughs) (laughs) It slowly doesn't look more and more like me. I don't like it. Um, You can see that I didn't like working on that piece. So now um, I'm always like, okay, so I want you to be really basic with the description you're giving me. And I want you to know that I need artistic freedom to make this look really, really good. Like, I'm not going to give you something you don't like, but you're going to have to trust me in that you can't tell me, you know, like what color her fingernails are going to be for me to, you know, get there, you know? Um, So I usually try to take on as much creative freedom and, Some people don't like that, but especially if you're working in freelance stuff, it's hard to say that because in freelance work, it does have to be a certain way, especially if you're working for like DC, you have to get the character to look exactly right. So if you really want to get into freelance work, you're going to have to deal with giving up a lot of your creative freedom. But if you're doing stuff like commission work, that's more, you know, illustrative or fine arty, then you can take back more of your power. And that when you were developing your style, I don't want to say style necessarily, but developing um, what makes you, you <laughs> as an artist, <laughs> um, what, what went into that? Like how much trial and error was there? Um, or was it just kind of like, all right, what you saw from the beginning of your Instagram was like the beginning or the genesis of Miss You Pacey? Oh, gosh. You know, when I look at the stuff that I posted like a month ago, I hate it. And <laughs> like, this is not what I'm going for. Um, so it's been this constant like battle with myself throughout my life to get to a style. And I think style is constantly evolving with everybody, including, you know, me. And it started off looking like a lot of other people's stuff. Like, that's just how you start out. You find art that you really like and really resonate with, and you just kind of like try to copy it all the time. And so I, that's how I started off when I first went to art school. My art was really, it didn't look like my art. And I started taking pieces and bits of other people's stuff like inking and then the color red that uh, this artist used in this style. And I used to watch a lot of anime because I was a nerd and, but I also like Disney. So I'm going to combine mm-hmm. like all these things 
And slowly but surely, I started getting a style and I, I really liked it. But even then, you know, after a week passed, I'm like, oh, well, I want to try this and I want to do this differently. And then I want to get into color. I don't like color. I'm going to get into <laughs> inking again. <laughs> and it just was kind of this fluctuation in this wave of either things I liked, um, movies I watched, magazines I looked at, books I've read. There's just so many things that influenced me to make certain choices that's when people ask me like, oh, how'd you develop your style? I'm like, I don't know. Like I just did things that I enjoyed. I played a lot of video games and I was like, that's cool. <laughs> you know, um, so I guess that answers the question. <laughs> yeah. In a, in a way, it's like a form of self-discovery. And like, yeah. I think I think that's really important too for any creative person is to not necessarily like paint yourself into a corner, <laughs> well, mm -hmm. not, yeah. not to use a bad metaphor, paint, um, <laughs> but to to not um, be like, okay, well, this is this is the way I started out, and it got a, a, a modest amount of likes or uh, response. So mm -hmm. this is the way that I need to continue. Um, it's so important, I think, to like you said, to willfully throw in all of the things that influence you, even if it's like, oh, I happen to watch this this anime tonight, mm -hmm. or I happen to go to the movies and see this, or play this video game, or go out in nature, like whatever it is that you did that day, like throw that into your art or incorporate that and just see where it goes, like to be willing to do that. Yeah. I mean, I think with style, it's constantly always evolving, just like we are as people. We're constantly evolving and learning and doing stuff. Um, so if you try to like stay stagnant with what you're drawing or like, you're like, oh, I like this style and other people like this style. So I'm going to stay here. If you do that, like you're either just going to get stuck, you'll never improve, or you just won't be happy with what you're producing. Because I think art is so connected to who we are as a person, even if it's, you know, I, I draw hot demon girls sometimes. And I don't necessarily think that's related to my personal growth. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's still that's how art is. It's just constantly connected to us and our emotions and how we feel and what we enjoy and what we hate. That if you stop and you try to keep it a certain way, you're just going to be fighting with yourself. Absolutely. Well, the one thing that has remained constant for you is, uh, is rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Why, why rabbits? Um, I, they're weird creatures. Have you ever they like are. really looked at a rabbit or like been around a rabbit for a long period of time? My, my sister had this rabbit that was huge. It was so big <laughs> and it freaked me out. It like, it would bite you too. Oh yeah. They're very, evil little guy. <laughs> they're very sassy. I had, um, a <laughs> rabbit named Buffy. I named her after Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Oh my gosh. And you're speaking my was, language. <laughs> she was the sassiest thing and she would huff at me when she like wanted my things and she would get up on my bed and like flatten it out and try to <laughs> kick me off of it because it was hers. Oh my gosh, they're so weird. They're like these little fluff balls with so much anger and creepiness inside of them that people don't see unless you stare deeply into their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I I think I have a fear of rabbits since since my sister, but I mean, it's understandable. They're, my mom hated that rabbit. <laughs> she was terrified of it. <laughs> That's awesome. So I also wanted to ask you about, um, because I read that you you were highly influenced by the golden age of illustration. Mm -hmm. And that's something I looked up because <laughs> I didn't really <laughs> know that there was a golden age. Can you talk mm -hmm. about that? Oh, yeah. Um, I would love to because I love talking about the golden age of illustration. Okay, cool, cool. Um, so it started off... I was in love with this artist called um, Charles Dana Gibson. And uh, I and he made like, I can't remember what they're called. Like the Gibson girls, I think was the title. And he used a lot of like inking and that's about it. It was just like a whole bunch of scratching inking work. It was so beautiful and so detailed. And I absolutely fell in love with it. And then I went to, I think it was um, one of my art history classes in art school where we talked about nothing but the golden age of illustration. And it was like 
my favorite class because everybody that we had to study was so incredibly talented. It was like during Norman Rockwell's time, all of um, the great pinup artists of that time, um, movie posters, because I hired a whole bunch of artists for advertisement and movie posters and everything because, you know, photographs were so expensive or they weren't really at the point where you could put them in magazines at that time. So it was all artists hired to do advertisement and everything. And they just were so incredibly talented. And it, it has the vibe that's just kind of cool and vintage that I really resonated with. I was never into like the Andy Warhol, uh, expressionist, all that kind of stuff. And I wasn't that into super fine art renaissance kind of stuff. And this kind of filled that category of both fine art like and also kind of not cartoony, but more expressive, which I mean, gosh, there's so many amazing artists from that time period that just inspired me. And Norman Rockwell, like I've looked up to him since I was a kid and he had one of, I think my doctor's office had a painting of his in the waiting room that I stared at so long as a child. And I was like, that's so cool. Like, this is the best thing I've ever seen. My parents had had one in their bedroom uh, <sighs> that I remember. It's so funny. It's such a part of my like childhood, but like the painting is, is nowhere to be found now, but I can so vividly remember staring at it forever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it was just, I think nobody knew what the golden age of illustration really was because you didn't, if you didn't go to art school and you didn't have to like study it religiously, it's like, oh, sure. But so many of those images have stuck with us in culture for so long. Like all of the Norman Rockwell pieces, all of, I think Frank Frazetta was kind of at the end of the golden age. Um, and just think of everything he's done. Like it's insane. They were just incredibly talented people. And so like when you, when something is called like the golden age uh, of something. And so like that ended in like the twenties, I guess mm -hmm. is, is what I read. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and then like, do you feel like when you're so closely influenced by that, by something that, you know, ended, you know, like a hundred years ago, do you feel like you, you're trying to bring it back? And I, obviously like, I don't mean to like <laughs> give a, a hubris, like oh, you, you're the one that's going to bring it back. <laughs> yeah, but like, like, do, that pressure. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But like, what I mean is like, do you feel like it's something that's lost that you're like, you're trying to bring back in your art or is it just something that just, you know, you kind of liked? Um, I think it was just something I really connected with that. Like I wanted to continue bringing into my art. I, yeah, I, I don't feel like I can bring it back because it's my art now is not very it doesn't look like the golden age of illustration. It's kind of way more modern. Right. So, it's like a springboard for you almost. Yeah, exactly. That's how I think of it. That's cool. Um, so I was wondering if we could talk about like your like your actual process of, of making art. What does a typical day look like for you? Oh, gosh, a lot of sitting at the computer, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a lot of responding to emails. <laughs> um, but I, the typical day, the process of me with art, it really starts with sketching. I usually sketch digitally just because it's faster and I can get like a lot more down on paper um, it's almost like brain dumping. So I get out my iPad and I just start drawing a whole bunch of things. I either mm -hmm. like it or I don't like it or I continue on or I keep, you know, working at this sketch. And once I find one that I like, um, I either print off the really rough sketch and then I put it on my tracing board and I put a piece of paper on it and I kind of finish it from there. So, you know, I go into making a nicer sketch, then I go into inking and coloring or if I'm not going to color it, then I just go overboard with inking um, and detail and everything. That's really the process. That seems a lot more boring saying it. <laughs> no, no. It's so like, I, th I think even the idea of like a brain dump is something that holds people back. Like the idea of sitting down, um, like when you don't have a solid concrete idea in your head, it's like mm -hmm. scary to sit down and just start like you said, like dumping, like making, 
perhaps bad sketches or just like things that are going to end up being just erased or thrown out. Um, so would you have any advice for someone who maybe has that kind of fear of the blank page or the blank computer screen or whatever it may be? Yeah, so that's exactly why I do digital, <laughs> because I'm always I'm so worried that I'm going to waste a page or waste a page in a sketchbook that God mm. forbid I can't rip out. <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah. terrible. Um, so I usually just go digital and I'm like, OK, so anything on this page can be completely tossed, never has to be seen again. You know, there's no embarrassment connected to it if I draw something terrible and I just sit down and I just start scribbling. And even if it's just an actual scribble, like there's no thought or drawing behind it, as long as I'm moving my pencil around the page and just getting ink to paper or digital ink to a digital paper, mm -hmm. it helps start something. Like you just have to get in this flow. So just do whatever, make trash, do a whole bunch of circles or lines or whatever. And after you like warm up, then you're like, oh, okay, this isn't so bad. I've already ruined the page. So I guess I can <laughs> start drawing something on it. <laughs> so that's usually just, you just got to jump into it. Right. Yeah. Um, I do something similar with writing and I know that some days it's like, the floodgates open and like mm -hmm. everything, like I can't keep up with my own ideas, not saying that all of them are great ideas, but <laughs> either way, like I have that kind of excitement where like, all right, got to get this down. Oh, this spurred another idea. I got to get this down. And then other days it's like, I have to sit down and then it's just like, okay, I'm writing garbage. Okay. It's still garbage. <laughs> it's, still it's not getting garbage. any better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, does that happen to you? Like, do you have like days where it's just like idea, 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 and then other days where it's just like, all right, I'm literally just scribbling? Oh, yeah. It's almost exhausting how many days I have like that. Like, I think yesterday I was like, oh, I have this idea. Oh, this is going to be awesome. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll draw this and this. And like the day before I was sitting there, you know, staring at the screen, just being like, can I think of anything? <laughs> like, <laughs> where did my creativity go? Like, I thought I went to art school and suddenly I can't prove that anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've had plenty of those days. And then does that lead to negative self-talk or like this idea that like, oh, I lost it. Like, if I can't produce, do you have any um, mental resistances maybe that you have to overcome? Yeah, I mean... Dealing with that and being my own worst critic to being like, oh, so you can't like make anything? Like, are you an artist? Like, why does this look bad? I thought you were better. Um, I constantly have that going through my head, which is not healthy, not good. And then also social media, like as great as social media is for artists, it's also horrible in the fact that you're just comparing yourself to people constantly because I think about all the amazing artists I follow on Instagram and I scroll through during the morning and I'm like oh my god I'm never gonna be able to do what these people do and oh my god they're they're getting all these jobs and I haven't been contacted by anybody recently and oh look they've sold out of this print and I can't sell out of this print and it's just this just this negative thought that continues on and on. And I really struggled with it for a really, really long time until I was like, okay, so I think I'm spending too much time on social media. I think I need to just post, stay there for 30 minutes to respond to any comments, and then I'm going to walk away because I just got to the point where I wasn't drawing because I was looking at everybody else's art and being like, oh, well, I'll never be able to do this. I guess I should just give up. So I have this really weird relationship with like Instagram. I love it and it's helped me become the artist I am today and I wouldn't be anywhere without it. However, it's put a lot of negative thoughts into my head. It's also made me feel really down about myself and affected my mental health to the point where I have to stop looking at it. And do you have like a like a day-to-day, -day, I don't want to say formula, but maybe like a rule for yourself where you kind of know your own tendencies. So you know that you're only supposed to be on there for a certain amount of time. Like it is necessary, you know, mm -hmm. like it is necessary to see what other people are doing. Um, but then to have that kind of mental barrier, I guess, like where you're not 
try, <laughs> trying to compare and despair. You know what I mean? Like, do yeah. you have any sort of words of wisdom for, cause I, I think that's, that's another big problem that people just haven't been able to figure out like with how to deal with and how to have this relationship with social media and the people that are on the other end of the social media. So I don't know. Do you have any words of wisdom? Yeah, I, I sort of, because I still struggle <laughs> with it daily, mm -hmm. but like, you really just have to start, you know, taking control of all the intake of all the things that you're seeing. I actually have a timer set on my phone. So if I spend, uh, you know, over like two hours, I think on social media, it shuts it off. So I can't get back on it, mm -hmm. um, which <laughs> seems like a long time, but I think every day it tells me to get off. <laughs> yep. yeah. um, so you kind of have to like, set these times. And then I also like set a work schedule since I'm a freelancer, I work from home. You know, it's hard for me to not go to 12 PM at night working. Um, so I set days to be my weekends. I don't go on Instagram. I don't check my emails. I don't do anything, anything like that. Or like after 6 PM, um, on weekdays, like I'm off, you know, I, I'm not going to go and look. I'm off of just gonna, work, off of work, off of okay. emails, social media, and the actual art itself. Yeah, pretty much. Interesting. I try to, because I mean, I really like drawing and it's really fun, but I do burn myself out. Like it's it's a terrible thing that I do to myself where I have so many ideas and I try to pump them out, but then I have like a week of not being able to draw anything because I burn myself out completely from drawing nonstop. Right. And yeah. do you, will, will you stop like mid piece, like mid project, like mid <laughs> brush stroke? <laughs> I, I really hate doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like if I didn't stop myself at like that six o'clock chime, I don't have an actual uh, clock. So I guess I don't have a chime. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I, I try to stop. I'm like, okay, I've gotten this far. I can set it down and I can pick it up tomorrow because I need the time to decompress, you know, do something else with my life because I would like to have hobbies again since I turned my main hobby into my career. <laughs> um, but yeah, I usually, if I'm working on something, I try to just stop like it's an actual job. So I love that idea because it is a job. Mm -hmm. You are, especially, you know, whether you're a freelance writer or, or artist or whatever, like, or I used to be a professional poker player. It's like <laughs> you have to set your own schedule. It's really hard to be your own boss. But I like that idea of, you know, okay, the the chime or the, or the bell or whatever, <laughs> just seeing that it's six o'clock and, and stopping that idea of, especially if you're like excited about it and like the reason you want to continue is because like, oh, I want to get this done. It's like ending on a cliffhanger, like watching mm -hmm. a show and like ending it on a cliffhanger where you're like excited to get back to like the early hours the next day. And I think that's something that people struggle with, you know, like whether it's like going to the gym or, or, you know, sitting down to write, sitting down to the blank page to not have a blank page for yourself, like where mm. you're like, all right, I can get right into it. I can't wait to get this started the next day. It's like setting future you up for success. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it's it sucks when you're like, oh, man, I could have just finished this. <laughs> but then you can be like, oh, I can finish this tomorrow and I have something to like sit down at and get started. And I'm not sitting there being like, I don't know what to do today because I, I don't have anything just, you know, left. Right. Um, so I, and I think it's really important that people, especially in the freelance industry, you know, set time to you know, be an actual human being and do things that are fun. Again, that brings it back to the style thing. Like if you're not doing anything or if you're not enjoying anything, then your art's not going to improve and you're not going to continue your style out because you're stuck just working on the same thing over and over again. Right. And also then when you're able to, you know, finish something early, and then the next day you have that success of being able to like have a finished piece to springboard you into the next piece or whatever. You know, if you have to do a new brain dump, at least you have that kind of excitement of accomplishment, you know? Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, it's it's hard. It's definitely hard. And time management has been the struggle of my lifetime being a freelancer. 
Mm-hmm. And so what have you used to, to help you with that struggle? <laughs> like, do you have calendars or schedulers or um, just like a drill sergeant that you have hired to like follow you around? Or like, how I, do you... should. <laughs> <laughs> I should. I should find that. <laughs> Um, I actually became like a huge planner nerd in the past like year or so to the point where I like go on YouTube and I watch these girls like decorate their planner. I've become one of those people. (laughs) Good. (laughs) So I got like this giant planner and every morning I go in and I make to-do lists for the day and I make to-do lists for the week and then I make to-do lists for the month and then I make to-do lists for the year. So it's like everything is laid out and I try to like either do it every morning or do the weekly ones every Sunday so I can be set up for Monday and sticking to that and having calendars everywhere has really, really helped me. But I have to schedule in me time to force me to do stuff that's fun (laughs) or else I'll just work. (laughs) So again, with the time thing, you know, at 6 p.m. I stop and on weekends I actually plan things. So I get out of the house for once. Mm -hmm. Um, And now I'm actually, uh, I started tattooing. I'm uh, apprenticing for tattooing. Um, So I have like those days selected to actually get me out of the house and go do stuff. And then I take the day off afterwards. So I've been a crazy planner recently. Very cool. I'm going to ask you about the tattooing in a second, but yeah. you, you've mentioned like the, you know, setting time aside for like, I don't want to say me time, but like <laughs> to have those kinds of inputs where you're actually like being a human being <laughs> where it's not like work, 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 and like grinding yourself into oblivion. And, and burning yourself out because I think you you nailed it when you said like we need those external inputs and like things that motivate us and things that uh, inspire us and uh, just new things. So like what does that like when you set time aside for yourself um, for that? What does that look like? Is that like stuff you've already done before? Like what kind of activities are you doing? Um, I usually so I really use it um, for self-improvement type things like reading like I used to read so much and then when I got like out of high school I didn't read a single thing um and it really bothered me so now I set time where I read every day or I love video games and I stopped playing for so long and I was like okay so today I'm gonna play two hours of Red Dead Redemption you know um, what a or, drag like, go- I know <laughs> Or like go to the movies or something, just stuff Mm -hmm. that helps me feel better or improve myself or I just get to go have fun or improve relationships because that Mm -hmm. was another big thing that being a freelancer kind of took away from me is that I never saw my friends. I never hung out with them. I never did anything because I was always working and I was always busy when other people were like, hey, you want to go do this? So now I plan to like actually go out and go do something. Like I just went whale watching with my best friend and my boyfriend and her boyfriend. And it was great. I never, I've never thought of doing whale watching before. And I just felt awesome afterwards. And I came back on Monday and was like, man, I'm ready to draw. Like I had a great weekend. I feel rested. I feel like a person Mm -hmm, (laughs) and mm -hmm. I can get to work now. Right. Yeah, it's ridiculously important and very easy to when you're when you have this like new relationship with like art or, you know, whether you're starting a career or you're just like super into whatever your creative hobby is. It's like that does take over your relationships with Mm -hmm. other people. I've had to schedule in calls with friends like once a week. I make a call to one of my (laughs) college buddies like that I haven't talked to in like a couple years aside from, you know, the the Merry Christmas texts or whatever, you know, (laughs) it's like ridiculously important as a human and something very easy for easily forgotten. Oh, yeah. No, you forget it so easily. And, you know, your friends stop reaching out to you after a certain time because you keep turning them down. And then you get like this, oh, everybody else is doing things and I'm not. And you get this huge sense of FOMO. But like you created it from, you know, never going out and never doing stuff. And I I think it the whole hustle culture is really to blame for this issue where everybody's like, oh, in order to make it, you know, as an artist, you got to hustle, hustle, hustle. You got to do this and do that and never stop working. And 
for me, I got on that mindset and it was very, very detrimental to my mental health to the point where I was like, okay, I got to stop. Like that's, you know, life is more important than hustling 24 seven. For sure. Yeah. It's all that balance. Mm -hmm. Part of the whole reason this podcast started was the other end of it where it's like so much life stuff is happening that you forget about your art or, or you, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a decade has gone by when you used to love to draw or used to love to write or play, a, play an instrument or whatever it is. And it's like, you forgot about that relationship you had with that thing, but sometimes it goes way too far the other end where it's just like, you are just alone in a closet <laughs> playing, <laughs> playing your trombone. It's <laughs> a bad example, but, but you, I th hopefully you know what I mean. It's just like, finding that balance, I think is something that takes a long time. It takes the scale tipping way too far in one direction, learning that that's a mistake. Then it tips way too far in the other direction. You learn that that's a mistake. And it's just like slowly letting it even out and being okay, like not being too hard on yourself <laughs> as it <laughs> kind of evens out. Oh yeah. No, it, it feels so weird that I have to force myself to have fun, but it did get to that point. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. So you mentioned tattooing and I saw who you're mentoring with, uh, Sarah Fable. And she mm -hmm. was, she was on the show actually before too. So that was like, whoa, cool. <laughs> so, uh, like how did that start? Like how long have you been wanting to do tattooing? And then like, how did that relationship form? Oh gosh. You know, it's mine and Sarah's like relationship story <laughs> is a wild ride of uh, me going to multiple people to who were going to teach me to tattoo. And then it just didn't work out for lots of reasons, mostly drama type reasons that I just didn't want to deal with. Hmm. Um, and I, ac I actually, I was going to learn under this dude and he was seeing Sarah at that time. And he invited me over to her house for a barbecue didn't tell her that he was inviting me. <laughs> and so I showed up and she's like, who is this girl who just showed up to my house? <laughs> and she did not like me. At all. Really? <laughs> yeah. Um, and then afterwards she had this huge fallout with this guy. Cause he was, he was pretty crazy. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, she knew she was worried about me. Cause she was like, Oh, this poor girl is probably like stuck with this guy and he's going to take advantage of her and yada, yada, yada. So she reached out to me and she was like, no, no. Like if you want to learn, like I'll teach you. Um, so we started out on this weird <laughs> part of like, Oh, she didn't like me. And then all of a sudden she's like, Oh, it wasn't her the whole time. And now she's become like the best tattoo mom I've ever had. <laughs> That's awesome. Yes, she's an amazing person. Um, and she's helped me through so much already, including like personal stuff to actually tattooing to art. So how does the process of learning how to tattoo? How does that differ from the skill set that you already have? Oh, I, you know, I thought it wouldn't differ too much, but it really does. Um, the tools completely different than anything I've ever used. It's a lot more um, focus on the tool that I'm used to. And I don't know if that's just because it's so new and I'm not used to it that, uh, I have to focus so much because you're worried about the depth of the needle, you know, to pull a straight line without shaking too much. Like there's so much that could go wrong with a tattoo compared to like pen and ink. So that was, a big hurdle to get over. And I'm still getting over that. There's still, you know, areas in which I can improve when it comes to, you know, straight lines and tattooing and all that stuff. And then you have to think about composition of a design because now you're not just on a flat plane, you know, you're going around somebody's arm or somebody's leg and, you know, your anatomy and the way things curve is gonna completely change your drawing compared to it just being on a flat surface. So then you have to think about that. So it's it's interesting coming from an illustrative background to tattooing because it's a completely different art form. Yes, you have to be a good artist, um, but also you have to like win this battle against these monstrous tools mm. of a needle <laughs> and ink <laughs> and an actual canvas that's alive and that you can hurt. <laughs> right and who moves and everything. So um, it's, 
it's kind of feels <laughs> kind of feels like I'm in the matrix nice. trying to figure this out. Yeah, nice. um, <laughs> and at least I know how to draw. So I got mm -hmm. that, but everything else. <laughs> right. That's so cool though. And uh, it's got to be rewarding also that people want your art on them <laughs> like permanent. Oh my gosh. I know. I every time somebody's like, "Yeah, I want a tattoo." I'm like, "Are you sure?" <laughs> <laughs> you know it's forever, like, really? right? <laughs> yeah, like it are you sure? <laughs> yeah. And I've had uh my friends who are like, "Yeah, I want to get a tattoo by you." And I'm like, "You don't have to." Like <laughs> just because you're my friend doesn't mean you have to. That's like so I don't know why I'm just convinced people are just trying to be nice to me mm -hmm. <laughs> when they want a tattoo, but I'm like, "Oh no, they must actually like it cuz they want it on them forever." That's awesome. Well, good luck to you in your uh tattooing journey. <laughs> I'm I'm really looking <laughs> forward to watching. Thank you. Thank you. And before we let you go, I also wanted to ask you about your Nightshade book. Now, I think mm -hmm. People missed, I think the, um, you had a Kickstarter, right? Yeah, I, it finished a while ago. Okay. So what, can you just talk about that whole process of how that came to be? Um, yeah. So I have done, um, art books before and I've done pre-orders for everything, but I came to the conclusion last year that I felt like my style got like uh, stunted or stagnant. Um, and I wanted to make an art book where I could literally close the book on my past artwork and move mm. on to something new. Um, so I had this idea in mind to just get a collection of the past, like three years of artwork and put it in a book, put it on Kickstarter and see if people actually wanted it and then make a book form of it. Um, and I had, you know, friends who have already done Kickstarters before. So they kind of helped me through the process of designing everything, um, figuring out how much everything would cost, how much Kickstarter takes, um, the fulfillment process, because so much goes into Kickstarter that you don't think about, um, like trying to figure out just how much every package is going to weigh, because that's going to affect the shipping. Um hmm. And, you know, you don't think about that when you're just being like, oh, I'm going to make a book. But no, you have to plan every single thing out. Just if it does get kickstarted and fully funded, then you have to get it all out, you know? Right. You're on You're on the clock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like you, there's no more, uh, oh, I'm going to make this book. It's no, you're making it now. You got to right. get it done. <laughs> right. Very cool. Ashley, it is time for the final push. And that's where I ask you to reach through the microphone and grab the shoulder of one of the listeners that you've already really inspired today and just give them your final words of advice and push them to pursue their own creative passions. You know, I just want everybody to know that no matter how big or scary it seems, that if it's something you love and if it's something you want to do, it'll be worth it. You just have to go for it. I know that you can't see the bottom of the pool, but once you're there, once you're swimming, the water's going to seem super warm and you're going to have a great day out at the pool doing your art, doing music, writing, whatever it is. You just have to go and you have to do it and you have to have faith in yourself because there's going to be points where nobody else has faith in you. But as long as you know you can do it, I know you can do it then you can, and you can make an awesome life with it. And I know you can do it too, so splash around. <laughs> splash around that yeah. pool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Ashley, this has been awesome. So thank you so much for coming on the show and for sharing your story and inspiration. And uh, I really do appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I hope this helps somebody. Oh, it helped me, so I know it's going to help <laughs> other people as well. Um, Perfect. Done. And – for everyone listening, you can find Ashley on her website, missyoupacey.com, on Instagram and Twitter. She is Miss you Pacey. And we'll have everything we talked about today with Ashley at yourcreativepush.com slash 351. Ashley, thanks again. Thank you. My thanks once again to Ashley for coming on the show. Two quick things here at the end of the episode that I want to touch on. 
Uh, the first one very briefly, uh, because in the episode we talked about how you have to make time to uh, do social things, but you also have to make time to connect with your friends. And I talked about how I vowed to call one friend a week. That's something that I was maintaining back at the time that we had this conversation. But now I think more than ever, does this apply to all of us? And for me, being stuck at home in quarantine, it's become almost a necessity to reach out uh, pretty deep into my contacts to all my friends that I've kind of lost touch with and reconnect with them. And it has felt so good to reconnect with all my friends. And for me, at least, they're very, very needed uh, at this time. So if you are not uh, reaching into your phone book, reaching back into your deep friendships that you've had, that maybe you've lost contact with people, now is the best time to reach out to them as we are going through this uh, crazy time. If you find yourself bored and just scrolling through Twitter, but not feeling like doing art, make those connections because it's not only important to to maintain those friendships, but it's so valuable in just getting through these sometimes very long days. And the second point that I wanted to recap real quick was something that Ashley mentioned in the beginning of the episode about putting your wildest dreams into your five-year plan. And we dove so deep into it in the episode that I don't want to spend too much time recapping the fact that Five years from now isn't that far away, but it's also far enough away that you can get so much done. You can get so many of your dreams either accomplished or brought so much closer to you if you have that focus, that Neil Gaiman mountaintop focus. But the point that I really want to make about the the five-year plan thing is that Again, this is a crazy time we're living in, and this is a sort of reset opportunity for all of us to find out and really delve into what's most important to us and what we really want out of life. This is an excellent reset opportunity. It's like that feeling that you can get uh, New Year's Eve or New Year's Day, starting a New Year's resolution, uh, where you get that reset Uh, opportunity to kind of go into the new year full force with that energy. You know that in five years, you're going to be looking back at these days as an anchor point in your life. So try to get your feet grounded and figure out what's most important to you, where you want to go from here. Things are crazy right now, and they're going to remain crazy for some period of time, but eventually things are going to get back to some sort of normalcy. So make sure that you know exactly where you want to be heading when things do return to that point so that you're not scrambling and so that you can go into life full force, set that five-year destination for yourself, and set a plan in motion to get there. On our next episode, we have Dan Ekis. Dan is a comic artist and writer best known for creating the series Odyssey Inc. and Soul of the World on Webtoons. He also has a great YouTube channel where he interviews other artists and creators, and he gives his take on a lot of things that we talk about in this podcast, such as art block, such as motivation, such as art school, a ton of different stuff. And we get into all of that in depth on our next episode. If you want to find out more about Dan, you can head to his website, danekis.com, D-A-N-E-K-I-S.com. On YouTube, he is Dan Ekis, and on Instagram, he is Ekis Dan, and we'll have that all linked up at today's show notes page, as well as everything we talked about with Ashley at yourcreativepush.com slash 351. But that's all I've got for you today. Hopefully, you were inspired to go and get your work done, so go and get it done. Contact those friends. Make that five-year plan, and remember that the universe deserves your creations, and you are the universe. I love you all so much and we'll see you next time. Bye. Hey YouTubers, if you like this episode, I handpicked another one for you. I think you'll like it just as much. Just click it right there on the left side of your screen and on the right is a playlist of episodes from guests that came from the same creative field as the one that you just listened to. And please, please don't forget to hit that like button on your way out before it goes away. Enjoy the next episode.